Our next presenter is Clint McKay. He's a cultural bearer, traditional artist, serves on the board of California Indian Basket Weavers Association. He is Wapo's spiritual leader and the head man of a traditional dance group. McKay has also has a master's degree in indigenous education. Please welcome Clint. Thank you. I just want to say before I get started, I want to thank some folks as well, Joe, for asking me down here and um, most of the Autry staff that has been so, so kind and generous um, to me. I want to also comment on what Joe said just before lunch about my cousin Marshall and the feeling that's here today. And although perhaps it does have something to do with that picture in the back, to me, it has a lot to do with the number of times my cousin's name has been mentioned today versus yesterday. Um, and it's good for us to hear that now. Um, also, before I want to get started, I want to, I want to thank my cousin for bringing me here. Um, a few years ago, he asked us to come down to partake in Indian market here. And uh, I wasn't sure what our mission was. We were told to come down here and bring some of our regalia, bring some baskets, and they had a show here that people could enter their art, I guess. And we came down not really to be that involved in what people called art. We came down here because my cousin asked us to come down here and do some education work. I had no idea what we agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> but we did. But we did. Um, and so I want to say before I get started here, uh, I am an enrolled member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomo and Wapo Indians up in Sonoma County. And I'm also from the Wintoon tribe. And uh, part of me, what we call Wapo, what they call us Wapo, in order for us to be federally recognized, we have to have their labels. And so many of our tribes, I hear people talk about the name that they call themselves means people or the people of the earth. That's not the case with my tribe. We are known throughout our home region as Onatsatis. Onatsatis means the truthful talkers, the ones that speak the truth. So truthful to the point that sometimes unintentionally um, you offend people because the truth is the truth and it stands alone. So sometimes people will hear me stutter a bit, stammer like I'm searching for a word in the first, for the first reason is I speak my own language much better than I do this thing called English. So I'm trying to find the right word. And I'm also trying to modify what it is I say with what I know in my heart and according to my indigenous ways of knowing I have to say, but to try to temper that in order for us to have, what did they call a meaningful, respectful uh, discussion here today. So um, I'm, going, I'm going to do my best uh, to do that. All right, if we can, oh, do I have the thing up here? Now all I have to do is figure out how to work it, huh? Let's try this one, okay. So this is um, a little bit about me and my beginnings. I think the most important thing to me here is, um, well, no, the very most important thing was I'm married to my lovely wife, but um, I was very, very blessed and I'm very fortunate to have been raised within my traditional culture and in my traditional ways. And uh, you know, one of the taboos of my people is be careful what we say, lest you sound boastful or that you're bragging. So I wanna say that everything I, I talk about with my family and 
and, and, and what I'm able to do today comes with the utmost humbleness and reverence for, for those that came before me and endured far more hardships than I ever will. Um, and I'm and I'm so grateful and I'm so honored and thankful that they were able to do that, that, that I was raised in a home speaking my language and following my traditions and living my culture. And sometimes when I give presentations, people ask, oh, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been weaving? How long have you? And I take that like, how long have you been an Indian? When did you start being Indian? Before I came into this world, I don't know anything any different. I don't know any other way to live. And I don't want to. Um, again, I'm grateful. As the chair of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association for three terms, I toured this great state of ours and I heard and I witnessed firsthand the devastation that many of my brothers and sisters have endured and the loss of culture and how, how hard those of us that, although we certainly faced atrocities, were blessed not to have lost that connection, not to have lost our culture in that way and trying to figure out how we can support these communities and help them not learn how to make a pomo basket or a chumash basket or a miwok basket, but try to help them reclaim their culture and their tradition and what's, what's right for them. So um, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very honored and um, fortunate for that. Also, it is in my way and it is culturally appropriate for me to always identify. I know some of my brothers and sisters stand up and they identify themselves through their lineage so that people know who they, who they are and where they come from, can place them. Um, it's, it is culturally appropriate for us to always remember where we received our indigenous ways of knowing. Who are our teachers? How did we gain this knowledge? And to never, ever forget them. So for me, my Auntie Laura Summersall was incredibly important and what a wonderful teacher she is. Because you see those numbers up there are just a picture in time. It has very little effect spiritually and culturally because she still teaches me every day. And I was blessed to live on our reservation right next to her. She was what we called one of our last connections to those early days. Auntie didn't learn how to write her name until she was 80 years old. She's one of the people, I always challenge people, I say, whatever your ethnic background is, if I could have some time with you and I could sit and just ask you questions about your culture, about your tradition, how long would it take? How many questions would I have to ask before you honestly answered me? I don't know. I was blessed to be in this world with Auntie Laura for a long, long time. I never heard that response from her. She knew everything we asked her. And that is as much of being the real deal as I could imagine. We never ask her anything about our ways, our traditions, our language, our dances, our basketry, our food ways, all of the things that make us who we are. She never once said, I don't know. And that is an amazing gift. And I'm grateful to Aya that we still have the opportunity to be with her. And my, <clears throat> my auntie Mabel McKay, and how blessed we are to have her in our life. And how many years,
These, these women are absolutely amazing to me. And what they've done for their people goes far beyond anything we can discuss here today. Again, because like Auntie Laura, if there was a part of Auntie Mabel's culture, she knew it. She lived it every day. And uh, she continues to teach us and, and her people, the Cash Creek people, are, are um, I don't know, they're just, um, they're just really special in what they do for us and for Indian country. And Auntie Mabel certainly was a master weaver and a a spiritual healer, what we call around these parts, we just call them Indian doctors, what they are. And, uh, you know, she was always well known for that, but it seems like that notoriety, since she has left us for the land of our ancestors, has become more widespread now than when she was in this realm. Um, but again, there's not enough lists of, of things to add on to, to them and what they did and the advocacy they were on behalf of not only their tribal people, but Indian people in general. And then there's my dad, Floyd. I always talk to my dad and he says, Well, I've always considered myself a strange duck. I never had friends my own age growing up. I never wanted to do the things that young people did. Sounds crazy, I know. I never had any hot rod cars or never went out partying and doing all the things that most young young folks do. I, I found my comfort among my old people and my elders. And that's where I always just seemed to fit in. To this day, my dad tells me, son, probably longer than that now, close to 150 years. But in his words, as I was growing up, my dad always told me, son, you were born 100 years too late. You're like a man from another time. The world you want to live in no longer exists. It can't be that way. Because you see, when people call me contemporary, I'm just being honest. I'm onats atis. It's almost a shot to me. I don't want to be contemporary. I don't want to be new. I want to be like them. I hear a lot of names being dropped these last two days. People talk about mentors they've had people that have guided them, people that have directed them, people that gave them their start. I hear people quoting scholars, whatever that is. I don't know what that even means. What does that mean? These are three people that gave me my start and they're my heroes and they continue to be my mentors. And they're the ones that I quote. And they are the ones that I follow. And I saved the picture of us for last, but I also learned a lot from my big cousin. Like I say, he's the one that brought me here on this educational art journey, if you will. And I say this with respect, but I also say this with honesty. I think with him in more ways than one without him, I wouldn't have ever come here. I wonder if this wasn't the Marshall McKay seminar, if my email bell would have rung. I wonder if the buzzer on my phone would have gone off if it wasn't for my big cousin. I don't know. Anyway, we'll get on with my presentation now. And they're probably going to give me that big hook, my brother. (laughs) Dallin was talking about. (laughs) 
So I struggled with this incredibly. California Indian indigenous art defined. I don't know how it's possible to define it. I certainly can't define it because I don't know what it is. I don't know what art is. I can't make a distinction between what is art and what is culture. What is who I am? What is who I am? What does art mean? I'm not a professor, but I am a teacher at a high school back in Sonoma County. I teach indigenous education at the high school level. And I asked my students, I said, what is art? There's 25 students in my class. I got 25 different answers to what is art. So I think for me, it's really hard to define because I'm one of those people who don't consider themselves an artist. I always tell people that. They invite me down here. They invite me to other places. They put my baskets or my regalia on display, and they tell me how beautiful my art is. And I say, I'm not an artist. I'm just an Indian trying to keep my culture alive, trying to keep my tradition alive, trying to let people know, let them visually see what we talk about so often when we say we're still here. So I don't know how we ever, at least me, I don't know how I ever engage in what is art, but I tried throughout my presentation. Again, art to me is things that I seen, that I see painted on a buffalo robe or that I see paintings of things. And and I, to me, I'm like, those people are artists. They were given that gift. I wasn't given that gift. That's not me. I can't draw a stick person. I, I, that, that's not me. So I'm just, I'm just an Indian trying to keep my culture and my traditions alive. I do believe that most of what I see, at least in California, is I say some of the tools and perhaps even the materials have changed, but there's still that connection, that sense of place. And what that means to us Again, I'm very, very fortunate. My reservation sits at the base of the mountain that holds our creation story. My people, we were moved out of there. Yes, we had four of our own trail of tears, if you will, for my people. But we also always found our way back home. And we weren't moved out of state. I'm talking about being moved two or three counties. So we're very lucky that our reservation sits at the base of where we came from and where someday we will return. So some of the questions that were asked in the last, during our last panel, I was like, my wife was giving me this because I was, I want to answer that. I want to answer that question. And she said, it's not your turn. Just wait. But, but I, And basketry is my thing, and it is what Pomo people, I believe, are known for, right? So we, I think a lot of different Indian tribes have something that people say, bam, you know, oh, that tribe, I think of this. When people think uh, or they hear Pomo, people are going to go to baskets. That's where they're going to go for the most part. So I centered, that's what I know um, very well and what's near and dear to my heart. So I centered my presentation, although I hope it has a varied message, I'm going to use basketry as that, do they call it a medium? Is it a media or medium? Is it a medium? That's my medium, okay? Yum, yum. So, so Pomo, I, I, I want, oh, sorry. See, this is the other thing. I'm, I'm used to like walking all over the stage and I realize we're, you're on camera, so you've got to stay right here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I hear a lot about Pomo baskets in the art market. And I wonder if our people ever considered themselves artists. When it comes to basketry, is basket weaving an art? Is it classified as art? I don't know. I don't know. It is not to me. 
And I want to talk about the art market, if you will, started in the late 1890s and continued. For me, what I could tell from Pomo basketry up until about the 1980s. And although, yes, most women wove at that time, in my tribe, people of both genders wove and continue to weave. Uh, but Clint, why is there such a disparity in the well-known weavers are the women and not so much the men? Uh, doesn't really have to do with an art market for us. And again, some of our, our earlier panelists covered this. During that time, when we were removed from our tribal lands, I'm not going to say reservations, we've never been removed from our reservation, but we were certainly pushed around within our tribal territories. And when we were put places, we had no idea how to survive in this Western, and I'll be, I'm trying to be polite here, call it a Western world. Um, but we knew we couldn't survive. We knew we didn't have all of the opportunities that were afforded the other people that came in mainstream society. I also have a problem calling them the dominant society because they certainly don't dominate me or my people. They might be mainstream, but they're not dominant, okay? And so what happened was our people had to find work where they could. And my grandmother up in Healdsburg in Sonoma County was born on McCutcheon Ranch. McCutcheons still own a big ranch there in Alexander Valley. And so all of our men were off working in these ranches, you know, not too much gold where we were from, where I am from, but they were off working, trying to survive in this new society the best they could. And the women were at home to try to keep the home, try to raise the children, and try to raise money any way they could. And so they wove baskets. And because of their superiority in doing that, they became a part of this art market and it became a way for them not to be prestigious, <laughs> not to have their name in lights or say, my baskets are at this institution. It wasn't about having your baskets at some institution. It wasn't about being written in some book or have your, your beliefs or your sayings quoted. It wasn't to be able to stand up at a podium at a seminar and be recognized as what? Recognized as what? And so my feelings about mu museums, and I'll get into it a little bit later, is certainly tempered by that time frame and what people consider the value or the spirit behind that was made for the art market. It was made for sale. What are you talking about? What are you talking about that's sacred? What are you talking about repatriation? Are you kidding? They made these to sell. No, they didn't make them to sell. They made them to survive. They made them to survive. I would venture to say most of us are not in that same boat today. So, and I also say, traditional practices and rules, what makes something sacred? What makes something special and from the heart and from the spirit of somebody? If somebody were to very, very rarely sell a basket, now I say never, I give far many away than I sell. If I were, do I not follow my same traditional practices? Do I not offer those do I not follow those same rules? Do I not make those same offerings, those same prayers when I'm out collecting and gathering my material? Do I not follow the same weaving rules? I have to. As a pomo, as a wapo weaver, I have to. Whether I sell that or give it to my children as a gift, whatever I do, I still have cultural protocol I have to follow. So yeah, can they be traditional and still be considered art? I guess it depends on what you call art. So if they are indeed art, if pomo baskets are considered art, we use art in every day. 
art isn't something that we hang on a wall. Art is something that we give of ourselves and our, the spirit that comes within us. And so here we see burden baskets that now when we come to visit them, because of what they were treated with and things, people say, put on these gloves. You can't touch these things. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for letting me see them. Thank you for letting me come and visit my baskets. I appreciate that. And so we lived with these. And we say that they are living, breathing things. And if we do that, how we care for them is of the utmost importance. Again, going to some of my, I can't think of the right word right now. So let me say issues with museums. But here we have burden baskets. Here we have winnowing trays and parching trays for the hot colts. Mrs. Mrs. Josepha Dick in the middle <clears throat> and Mrs. Joaquin on the end gathering tarweed for pinoli. Here's a little more recent one. Um, it just shows that's not a pomo basket, but it, at the, um, it's a display where I was asked and I was honored to be asked to tend the fire and heat the rocks for a very dear friend of mine, Lois Connor. Uh, to demonstrate cooking in, in, uh, in, in a basket. But these are works of art that have a life. They're living, breathing things. And they need to be treated as such. Not locked away in a cabinet somewhere. So over the holidays, again, I don't, I don't usually make baskets. For, I never say never. But my, our three daughters kept saying, Dad, you, could, do you make the basket and you give it to them. And you make the basket and you gave it to her. And you make this basket and you give it to him. Dad, do you know how long it's been since you gave me a basket? <laughs> and I'm working on one for my granddaughter now, for one of my granddaughters that will be about this big and about this high with the abalone shells and the clamshell dangles hanging, quail tops around the top. I'm working on that, but I felt that it was important because they were asking me for these baskets for a long time, that I had to take time out and respond to their request, not on a verbal level, but on a father-daughter level. And, uh, you know, none of us know what's going to happen. And this, to me, was it a gift of culture or is it a gift of art? I never thought of this as art in these designs that I put in these baskets. It's a part of me. That's what they were asking for. They were saying, I'm sorry. They were saying, Dad, will you give us a part of you? Can we have that? And that's much more powerful to me than something that's considered art. So I was honored by my daughters asking for these baskets. And it took me, I'm not as fast as I used to be. I gave myself about a month and I thought I could knock them out if I really got serious. And it took me almost four months to make those three baskets. But I don't know if it's art or not. I don't know what I gave them if it's art, but I know they did get a part of their dad that day. And they certainly got a part of their culture that day. So I wanna talk about an experience I had and I know she's here now, and I'm grateful that she made it today. And I'm going to show my, I guess ignorance is the right word, unfamiliarity. Because I always stayed home. I didn't want to be a traveler. I never wanted to go places. I never even was around a lot of different Indian people. I never went around. I just stayed home and practiced my culture and my tradition and doing my thing. So again, until my cousin brought me, I never heard of the Autry. What's the Autry? I don't know what the Autry Center is. You know, I'm from a little town, little reservation in Northern California. I don't know what goes on down here in the big world. And so I got a call and I got an email that said, hey, there's this thing called Jules Tavernier. 
And this is a painting of, I don't know how long ago, by I don't know who, some guy named Tavernier, who this painting traveled all over the place. They thought it was lost. All of a sudden, they found it. My brother in spirit and almost blood, um, uh, Mr. Robert Geary from LM. I guess they got in contact with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and they decided they were going to put on this exhibit about Jules Tavernier, and I guess they decided to incorporate a little bit of Pomo stuff in there, expand beyond this painting. And so anyway, I got this notification that said, Clint, we'd like to know if you're interested uh, in putting uh, some of your stuff on loan at the Met. I don't know. I'll get to that email when I get time. I really don't have time right now. And a couple of times, and pretty soon my cousin, Sherry Smith Ferry, said, Clint, are you, are you interested in this? And I'm like, yeah, I guess, Sherry, if you and Bob think it's a good idea, go ahead. And as I traveled around Indian country up home, People would ask me, hey, did you hear? I said, yeah, they're taking some of my baskets. They, they want to display them. And they said, where? And I said, I don't know, at this museum called the Met or something back in New York. And I mean, no disrespect. I'm not in the art world. I don't know what that is. I just thought, yep, here's another museum that wants to put some of my baskets. And it wasn't until really later and coming up to the opening of the exhibit that I realized, <clears throat> I'm in the mat. <laughs> I didn't know, and I looked around, and I'm like, I'm the only, if you will, contemporary, I'm the only present-day Pomo Weaver that was included in that exhibit. And then I really started getting weak in the knees, right? And uh, I, I just, I was like, I don't know, because I don't look at my work as that. And it astounded me that once I realized what the Met was, that they would want to put Clint McKay's basket as part of an exhibit? I, I, Auntie Mabel's baskets, I understand. Auntie Laura's baskets, of course. Clint McKay's baskets? I don't know. It was just really um, a weird feeling. But I do want to say for all those museum people out there, no matter what your ethnic background is, one thing that I've learned from my elders and a lot of my family in Dry Creek and Cash Creek follow this, is how you treat people and how you present yourself to them. We have a running joke, me and my wife and a friend of ours, we call her and she calls us Pomo Royalty. When you go around, <laughs> Pomo Royalty, Pomo Royalty. But that's how the people at the Met treated us. I was amazed when I went back there I hadn't been treated like that at museums before. It was strange to me that they would come up and welcome me there into that environment. And after that, at the Met, I guess they thought the exhibit was so good, they were going to put it, they put it on at the De Young in San Francisco. And I went there, and it was an, another wonderful exhibit. Some pieces were added. But I'm just going to say this because I have to. The reception that I received and my family received has never been the same as it was at the Met. And I, and, I, and I know someone who I now consider a very dear friend of ours, Shannon, when she seen me, when she knew that I was going to be down here, she texted me right away and said, I'm going to be there. And when she seen me yesterday, the first thing she did is come up and acknowledge me and give me a big hug and say, oh, it's so good to see you. And that means a lot because it is our people coming to share what we feel comfortable sharing with another society, with something that's very different to us and very new and, to be honest, quite frightening. Why do they want us here? Why do they want this information from me? What are you going to do with it? But that... We always talk about relationship being so important in the indigenous community and building that foundation on mutual trust and respect. You get it, my friend, Shannon, you get it. 
And I appreciate that. And it was an incredible opportunity. I'm more excited now than I was when they asked me because now more and more I'm realizing what it means, not for me, but for Auntie Laura, for Auntie Mabel, for all those people that came before me now. They don't need me. (laughs) Their baskets are all over the world. They are far more well-known than I will ever be, and that is appropriate. I strive to be able to carry their all, I'll tell you. <laughs> they, they were true, true masters. But the fact that my people today were seen at places like the Met and to be a part of that exhibit acknowledges who I am and the people that I come from and the teachings that I received. And that's far more important than any accolade Clint McKay will ever get. So thank you, Shannon, and thank you, Met. I'm almost done here. Um, California Native Art provides opportunities. And again, I'm calling it art. I don't know what to call it. If I don't call it culture, I don't know what it is. So for us, it's cultural continuity. It's the continuation of, of our people. Not of a culture so much, not of a tradition. I guess it's all of that, but it's us as a people. It's how we identify ourselves. It's who and what we are. And so people talk about, I hear people talk about these days, you know, those young kids, you can't make those, you know, you can't make those kids do anything. They got a mind of their own. Our our children and grandchildren didn't get a mind of their own. (laughs) We forced them to learn basketry. We forced them to learn their ceremonies and their traditions. We forced them to speak their language. When I go home and I walk into my house, we speak our language. They didn't have a choice. They learned our indigenous foods. They learned our sacred places around our reservation and throughout our territory. We forced them to learn that. Because I don't ever want that continuity to be broken. I don't ever want them to stand up here in front of an audience and say, geez, I wish I spent time, more time with my papa. I wish I spent more time with grandpa. I wish I would have asked dad this. I wish I would have asked dad that. And they're never going to have that escape uh, excuse. Yeah, you know, we had that loss in cultural continuity. No, you did not. And so what we don't do is force our children and grandchildren to practice it, right? I can't force my children to make a basket. Fortunately for my wife and I, all of our children and all of our grandchildren are just immersed in their culture and their tradition and their language. They get on me after dinner. We live on the, on the same property there. Our houses are right next to one another, all of us. And after dinner, they say, Uh, (laughs) Papa language time, Papa language time. You know, we go in and it's dedicated. Of course, at the dinner table, we're talking our language, but it's where they get to tell me parts of our language that they're interested in. And we go to that and learn that. So we force them to do that so that we know we have that cultural continuity. It's also an opportunity for education. For us, you know, we travel long distances sometimes, and I've been fortunate, I guess, to travel far more than I ever wanted to. And I've been sent by my tribe doing not only NAGPRA work, but basketry work, you know, from as far away from home as to University of Pennsylvania. And, 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 I, and I've traveled all over researching my people's baskets. And the education part, I have to tell you, is the most exhausting. It is exhausting to continually attempt to educate people. I know it's necessary. I know we have to do it, but it's extremely exhausting. And, uh, but we do it because we think it's important to have that dialogue and to have those conversations <clears throat> with, with each other. And so we try to educate about who we are, you know, and we talk about different tribes and things. And I, and I tell people, you know, I, don't leave this seminar and go tell people this and this and this is the case with Pomo Baskets. And I know it because Clint McKay said it in a seminar. He said it, so it is so. Clint McKay does not have 
the right or the authority to talk on behalf of all Pomo people, not even Dry Creek people, because when they put us on our reservation, they took people from several villages, uh, you know, and uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a geographic area and put us on Dry Creek. We're not all the same. But what I can tell you is what I try to educate people on is what my teachers educated me with. So there's that. And then this art thing again offers some sort of self Self-sustainability is the best way I could describe it. And it gives our people an opportunity to make a living at whatever they deem is art to them and whatever they feel is appropriate to sell according to their indigenous ways of knowing. Again, it's not for me to speak on behalf of anybody else and what should be for sale or what should not. It's up to the individuals, and that's something that happens here at Art Market. And it's wonderful that it does, and it provides that opportunity. And going in the education part, that it's exhausting. When we come down here, people don't know who we are. People don't know what this is. You come down here to try to set up a, a booth to maybe... <laughs> sell something and people come up and go, oh, wow, cool. What kind of rocks are those? <laughs> rocks? <laughs> These are, what kind of stone is that? Stone? <laughs> no, 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 no. So even within our own state, within our own local institutions, the educational part is exhausting. I also, again, I travel all around to try to provide input and explanations into what our art, our culture really means to us. And so a lot of times different institutions, organizations, private collectors, museums ask us in like we did for a little bit yesterday. What can you tell us about this Pomo basket, Clint? What does it mean? What does the designs mean? What's the material? Why would this have been made? Do you think it's appropriate that we have it here? I'm a collector, can I buy that? <laughs> so it provides a lot of opportunity for us to get out and do interpretive work so that at least it is still our voices being heard and we are the ones telling our story and representing ourself. Okay, this is my last slide. So I just want to say, again, you know, what is art to me? Art is culture, art is people. Art is my wonderful cousin. If there's anything to me that would be able to, to describe art it's what he done in bringing people together. People from all different tribes, people from all different communities, people from all walks of life. He has, because he's continuing to do it today, he has this unique ability to take all kinds of pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and somehow fit all those pieces together just perfectly into a beautiful, if you would, work of art, work of art. And so I'm really honored and I'm proud to be here today. And I'm proud that this thing, and I'm grateful for what the Autry has done in, in helping celebrate him. The exhibit that they put on for my Auntie Mabel was nothing less than incredible. And with the family's input to tell a story, the real story about who Auntie Mabel is. You know, you can go to any museum, most museums, and you're gonna find, oh, here's a basket, Mabel McKay. Oh, here's a basket, Mabel McKay. Here's a basket, Laura Somersault. Yeah, well, who is Mabel McKay? Who is Laura Somersault? The Autry really went out of the box when they made that exhibit to talk about Auntie Mabel, the person. All aspects of who she is, all aspects of her life, and what she did in advocacy 
for her people, all of her people, not just her Cache Creek people, Indian people from everywhere. And other institutions, I hope, follow the lead of what the Autry has done here when they did that exhibit for her. It's just nothing less than amazing. And everywhere I go, the people that had an opportunity to see that still tell us what an amazing exhibit the Autry put on for your Auntie Mabel. And, I, and although I, I really do appreciate it, I always say it was too long in coming but it was done and the Autry did it. And for that, I am forever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Clint, for your presentation, for sharing your family with us and your family stories and reminding us that your cousin did the same thing, shared family and experiences. And it was one of the first exhibits 12 years ago <laughs> that I got to be a part of was um, hearing your cousin talk about Mabel McKay when we were working on that show. So thank you for sharing. <laughs>